Uh, we're going to talk about one of my passions, and if any of you uh, have heard me give uh, a version of this talk before, you know it's my, my chance every year to exercise my very serious inner geek. So I'm going to tell you uh, about things that, that I'm passionate about. These are three of my four Australian shepherds. Uh, Linus, who is um, a few months beyond 13. Hamilton, who is a little over two. And Annie, who is just um, 10, not quite 10 months. Um, and these two went kayaking with me this morning, which was great. So we're going to talk about what's new, what's hot, and what's important in the literature. And one of the reasons I give a, a version of this talk every year is that many people in this field, and it doesn't matter at what level you do it, maybe you're a dog fancier, maybe you're a dog trainer, maybe you know, you're a non-veterinary behavior person, you might be a specialist, you might be a veterinarian who's interested in behavior. Most people don't have access to the literature or don't have the time to look for the literature or don't know where to look and where hot articles might show up. And this is really um, something that, you know, uh, academicians do all the time. And I just find the stuff that other people do um, fascinating. So this is sort of my version of scientific trivia. And I've chosen an array of papers um, that really span a very, very broad spectrum today. And we'll, uh, I'll review them fairly quickly and then I'll take any questions. Some of them I'll spend a little bit more time on because they've got details that, um, that are important. Some of them I'll give you the take home message. Some of them are just fun and, um, and they are for both dogs and cats. So I hope you enjoy this as much as I do. I um, am acutely aware that um, not everybody gets the experience of roaming through the literature in the way I do. And uh, it's just, you know, knowledge to me is just everything. Okay, while everyone is still fresh, um, we're going to do the molecular genetics papers, okay? And um, I don't want anybody's eyes to roll back in their head or people to worry. But I want to talk about two papers, one that came out in 2019 and one that came, the companion one that came out this year, and uh, tell you why these matter and where they could go and what the authors found. Whenever I do this talk, I try to concentrate on the current year, which tends to be the previous 12 months. So there will always be some papers from the year before that. Occasionally we miss a paper, it doesn't quite make the 12 month cutoff, but it's, an, it's a useful paper to discuss and I'll do that. These two are, are both very recent and they are um, in a journal that is an open access journal. And what that means is if you were to type in translational psychiatry and the author's name into Google, this article will pop up and you can read the entire article for yourself. You can download it. You can do all of that um, virtually. And for those of you who aren't familiar with the literature, let me tell you what open access means because it's important. Um, publishing is expensive. Putting together something that looks as good as this is expensive. Um, hiring somebody to edit a journal, like I edit the journal in the field, and you'll see some papers from it today. You know, these, these things all add into money, and people can subscribe to the journals. Their organization can subscribe to them, and that's the model, for example, uh, the Canadian uh, Veterinary Journal uses, and that's the model the American Veterinary Journal uses. Legacy journals um, and legacy publishers, like our journals from a legacy publisher, Journal of Veterinary Behavior, is an Elsevier journal. Um, they get groups to join with them. So uh, you don't have to have a membership in one organization. You can have it in a number, and you pay a reduced rate to have the journal. Open access means that the authors paid to publish it. It doesn't mean it wasn't peer-reviewed. It doesn't mean that it didn't get a rigorous review. 
it means it's broadly accessible for everybody in the world so that it can be cited frequently. And in academia, the number of times you were cited and the rank of the journals in which you're cited does matter. So this is a, actually a strategy to make sure people read your papers. And the uh, European countries actually have a number of arrangements with publishers where they can publish in open access papers without having to pay because somebody else paid. And it was a negotiated relationship. If you're in the United States, you're not that lucky. And if you're in Canada, you're not that lucky because an open access fee um, would be about so anywhere between 1,500 and 3,000 an article, just to give you an idea. Most journals have an embargo period. Our journal, the embargo period's 12 months. After that, you're welcome to post a paper of yours and people can share them. Before that, if you want to post it, you can pay the open access fee, which again usually runs between $1,500 and $2,000, but can be as high as $3,000. So um, if you belong to one of the consortiums, like most of the European countries do, you get to do this without reaching into your grant money. We are not so lucky. So that's the introduction to how to do this. And I'm telling you this because I think everyone should have access to the literature. I'm going to tell you what I find are fun facts to know and tell and to share and, and information that's useful, but you can go get so much of this yourself. And um, much of the stuff will be available to you in one form or another. And I would just encourage people of every stripe to do it. It's just incredibly fun. And I'll tell you what I tell the vet students. You don't have to read the whole paper. You don't have to be able to go into a lab and map genes to understand why this paper is important or why it's got fun stuff for you. You don't even have to understand how they're doing some of these things. Wait till you see some of the, the maps to find where the genes are. You know, that takes years of training. But you need to be able to read critically the introductions, the abstracts, the findings, and the discussion. And you need to have an open mind and you need to ask how they knew something, okay? And, th and you should be able to find that in plain language in the paper. And if you can't, the authors and the editors didn't do their jobs. And you should ask yourself, what do I think about whether or not somebody else could replicate these data? Is it possible? Have they made it clear enough that if I knew what I was doing, I could do it? And what's the domain of generality? Is this going to be something that I can apply to all my patients? Or is this going to be a subset? And the first two papers I'm going to talk about are actually going to be subsets. And they're going to be subsets because they focus on different breeds. And this is a 2019 paper that looked at two novel genomic regions associated with fearfulness in dogs. And one of the reasons that we're able to do these things is we know where many of the human neuropsychiatric genes are sitting. We know this from the fruit fly and the model rodent literature, and then people have gone and mapped the human genes from affected patients. And in humans, you can get thousands of patients with behavioral conditions. We're lucky if we get hundreds, and you're gonna see that in, reflected in the dog breeds. Um, and in this case, these genomic regions overlap this, the equivalent ones for humans. And that means that here you have two species that have worked together closely for 30,000 years, and they've got the same impairment. How does it manifest itself in dogs versus humans? Do these genes do something functional? Is there something that contributes to a set of fears that we can assess with these genes? And can dogs be used as models for this? In other words, dogs have a generation time that's much shorter than humans. Is there stuff we can learn from families of dogs that can benefit the dogs and benefit the humans? Okay, so this is German Shepherds. And they looked at fearful German Shepherds and anybody who's ever uh, treated fear in dogs has run into a fearful German Shepherd. Um, and I'm going to show you what they did because it's actually fairly clever. Um, this is exactly what we've done in some of our genetic studies, but we did them a decade ago. And I'll tell you, there was wisdom in not doing this stuff early. Um, the, just the, the technology to do this is now cheaper. So what they looked at is they looked at fear cases and they had 80 
German Shepherd dogs that they knew were fearful. And they knew this because the clients reported them as fearful and then they did some other assays. They had 193 German Shepherds who were not fearful. And I want you to notice the, the numbers, 80 who were fearful and more than twice that that weren't fearful. And this is the killer in molecular genetics. You always have many more unaffected patients. So when you do a study that looks at cases and controls, the case is the fear. The control are the members of the same breed who are not fearful. And when you look at this, you almost always have, in fact, I've never seen it where you don't have the controls way, way, way in excess of the cases. And in fact, in something like um, autism spectrum disorder in humans that's been mapped extensively, um, the reason none of those hits have really shown a lot of promise is they've had to lump conditions to get enough patients because the family lines are complex and uh, you've got about 10 to 20 times the number of controls in every sample. They also looked at noise, what they call noise sensitivity, uh, fear of noises um, in dogs. And they had 57 German Shepherds who were afraid of noises and 210 that weren't. And I was sort of relieved to see this because when we did this in German Shepherds, Border Collies and Australian Shepherds, that's about what we got. We got about four times um, the number of control dogs that we got for cases. And they looked at the overlap because noise reactivity, sensitivity, phobia, whatever you want to call it, fear of noises, is one of those classically comorbid conditions as is fear. So they had 34 dogs that had both, which is nice because it allows you to look at these cases separately. Because if they're, this on the, if they're being caused by the same chromosome, those overlaps should show up in the same place where the cases individually show up on your map if they are not caused by exactly the same set of genes, you should get a fear case and a noise case, and you should get an amplification of the signal when you have both. Um, and then they had some fear cases that, of course, didn't react to noise. And they had a series that had neither noise fears nor fear of anything else. Okay. And they constructed uh, both a noise reactivity and a fear reaction score in a very similar way to the way we do it in our studies. In fact, they use the way we do it as their model. And um, what they are trying to do is exactly what um, I really think everybody who studies this needs to do. You need to measure the frequency and the intensity of the, of the reaction. Because the dogs you really want to map are these serious ones. Because guys that are really sort of just a little bit affected, you know, how are you going to distinguish between a zero and a two? Okay. But a zero and a 10 is something important. And notice that most of the dogs with fears of noises are clustered in the mild range. Is that genetic? Is that situational? You know what? I would have only looked in at genetically dogs who had a certain cutoff and above. You can look at everybody. You have the money to do it. You have the resources to do it. But when you do your analysis, you should split it. And they are well aware of this and they describe the importance. And, he, and I was relieved to see this because for so long, um, I was the only person out there saying this really matters. And, and um, Hannes Lowe has also been saying it not quite as long, but he's, he's basically said, the intensity of the phenotype. You have to accurately describe the phenotype. It really matters here. So they, they scored these guys and then they used their scores to select the dogs they were gonna run through their genetic analysis. They used two clustering algorithms that you see here. You see a density of scores. You need a cutoff that is above this number. In other words, this is the variation you see and the differences in cases versus controls, okay? And none of these reach this level except the dots that are associated with chromosome 20. That tells you that statistically something is happening at chromosome 20, okay? Because this is the line beyond which you would have to 
have dots for it to not be random. Okay, and you calculate that on the basis of a lot of different ways of doing it. And this is a Bayesian estimate, which doesn't give you the distribution, but basically says there are two places you might want to look and 20 is definitely it. Okay, so if you then find map this region, you come up with a bunch of genes that are sitting in the region. And there are some hearing related genes in this region. And when we did our fine mapping, we found genes for cochlear formation. And this is an oxytocin gene. Okay, so that's an affiliative neurochemical and it's involved in the fearful dogs. So when you look at the overlap of um, these dogs, you get some really important areas that you might want to look at. Now, what good does this do you now? It doesn't do you any good now. Where this is going is in the ability to understand the structure of the population and ultimately a genetic test. Because if you're breeding German shepherds, you would really like to not breed the fearful and the noise phobic ones. So um, there is a future here, but the other place this is going in terms of understanding these conditions is once you have the genes, you can begin to look at mechanisms. So you can see how these genes are affecting the pathology and we can begin to understand that in a neurobehavioral sense, whereas we would sort of be hunting around for a very long time without being able to root it to something like that. Okay, so when you look at this year's paper out of the same group, they are again looking at fearfulness, but they are looking at Great Dane breeds. And why are they taking on this breed-related approach? Well, they're in Finland, and Finland has a very, very active kennel club. Um, the Scandinavian kennel clubs are all excellent. They all have good breed registries. They all have extensive insurance programs that go with the breed resident uh, registries. None of these countries have a stray dog problem. And that's important to know because shelters are rare there. There will be breed rescues, but you will not generally see shelters. And the places that have the best breed registries are um, without a doubt, Sweden, uh, Norway, and Finland. And so you're seeing their ability to take advantage of the health surveys that the breed clubs do to benefit both humans and dogs. So because these are Great Danes and they're not the most common dogs in the world, they had a cohort of 124 dogs with and without socialization or exposure. They're talking about being exposed to things that you might become fearful of as a covariate. And when they look at this, they, um, and I'll show you the genes, but they mention specifically the uh, map genes and um, related compounds in the area. This is important because the, this set of genes uh, tends to show up in the hippocampal area and hippocampus is involved in uh, learning associative behaviors and anxiety. So when you uh, begin to develop anxiety and you enhance it and enhance it and enhance it uh, due to exposure, this set of genes may facilitate that. So that's pretty important. And when they did the study, here's their stranger fear score. And they did uh, it, uh, this same group a few years ago, did an actual test that validated the questionnaire that they um, honed. And then they look at how exposed you are. So we've got some dogs, you know, that weren't exposed at all. And if you look at the cases and the controls, you've got a few cases out here that weren't exposed to anything. Well, how do you separate out whether or not that's genetic? The risk of that be not being genetic is great. But then you see pretty much everything else is mixed right up until you get to the dogs that are super exposed and they're, um, they're all controls. Okay, small sample size, but same thing. Here are their statistical levels and they've given you two so that you can see that they were struggling with this sample size to get there. And they identify using the same series of tests, chromosome 11, and then they fine map the genes in that area. And you look at these beautiful density maps. So all you have to do is, is compare the cases and the controls and ask, do they have the same colors in the same spot? These lovely heat maps 
are just very intuitive and they match to the base pair region and they have fine mapped two regions of chromosome 11 in Great Danes, which immediately gives you a way to develop a genetic test. Okay, so there is utility here. And you see all of the genes that might be involved and that may be important. And there's your MAP gene. Okay, the one that's involved in the hippocampus and, and the development of anxiety. And the MAP kinase pathway has been well worked out to be involved in all sorts of regulatory functions. We tend not to think of anxiety as something that's reinforced and has a regulatory function, but it certainly does at the molecular level. Okay, and here's the fine mapping just to show you that. Okay, which is actually pretty bloody cool if you're interested in this stuff. So, okay, now everybody's not fresh and we'll move on to pretty much everything else. So let's talk about feline social behavior. And I just want to say something. Yes, cats are social. They are not not social. They are not wholly solitary. They are not wholly independent as a preferred strategy. We're still walking around with the myth that cats are not social, that they, that they are um, always on their own and that they don't want to hang out with people and other cats. And, you know, cats are differently social than dogs. They don't have the same derivations that dogs do. We never truly domesticated cats. And by the time I'm done today, you're going to begin to believe we never truly domesticated anything because I'm going to discuss a fox paper that I hope you find fascinating. And, uh, you know, they're just different. You can be social in lots of different ways. So this is a very cool paper. Um, it's called The Quality of Being Sociable. The influence of human attentional state population and human familiarity on domestic cat sociability. And um, this is done with pet cats and with shelter cats. And with pet cats, they used unfamiliar people and people who were familiar. So people the cat knows. And in shelter cats, pretty much everybody is somebody they don't know. Okay, and I realize I should have lowered the blinds before I started this. Oh, winter, sunsets early. Um, so what they looked at was the proportion of time that pet and shelter cats spent close to humans when humans were being inattentive, so they were just present, which let's face it is what we do 90% of the time. And when they were actually being attentive to the cats, when they were actually looking at the cats and engaging the cats. And pet cats um, spend uh, very little time with unfamiliar people when they're not paying attention compared to when they are paying attention. And the pattern is very, very similar to familiar people. They will actually spend more time with unfamiliar people who aren't paying attention by a little bit. Um, and the uh, mean and medians are different for whether the um, person is paying attention and they're unfamiliar versus familiar. You get considerably more variation if the person is unfamiliar, but they still spend more time with you if you're paying attention to them, whether they know you or not. In a shelter situation, it's very similar. So shelter cats definitely spend more time with the people who pay attention to them than the people who don't pay attention to them. But they pay a lot of attention to people who don't pay attention to them. I mean, there is nothing in common with these inattentive distributions to pet cats. Now, this says something about how isolated shelter cats may feel. And if they weren't social, a shelter is an ideal situation if they're singly housed. And yet, they pay huge amounts of attention to people, even if the people aren't paying attention back, and even more when they are. And notice that this range is even narrower than for pet cats. So they're all in when somebody's paying attention to them. Now, if you look at meow vocalizations, you know that meow, meow, that solicitous vocalization cats do. The frequency when you look at pet and shelter cats 
In the inattentive state, pet cats are like, fine, you're not going to pay attention to me. I'm not going to solicit you. If you pay attention to them, they meow. Opposite in shelter cats. They meow a lot, and it's not statistically different than pet cats when you're paying attention. If you're not paying attention, shelter cats let you know it. Again, strongly suggesting that when you're in a restricted situation where you don't have a lot of social exposure, you're soliciting. So not quite the profile of cats that most people have. Many of you who followed the taglines in the popular press lately in the past weeks probably saw this paper flag. This is the role of cat eye narrowing movements in cat human communication. And this is a still from a video that they took. And again, this is an open access paper. Anybody can get access to this. Um, and here's the cat beginning to do the slow blink, the half eyelid, the closed eyelid, back up to the not fully open eyelid. And they looked at three conditions. They looked at a cat who avoids humans, a cat who is neutral, neither avoids nor solicits them, and a cat who approaches humans. And they looked at a slow blink stimulus given by the humans, so the humans would very slowly blink their eyes, and a neutral without eye contact stimulus. So you're there, but you're not actually looking at the cat. And in this situation, the slow blink stimulus was highly correlated with an increased frequency of approach. And it was never seen in the avoidance situation. And in the neutral situation, it wasn't seen that often. And these are all statistically significantly different. So there is an association between slow blinking by humans and approaching by cats. And that's all this paper says, okay? And then you can see once that's been established, I think you're gonna see people look for affiliative associations and lots of other issues. Okay, so let's move on to some of the problematic conditions and we'll talk um, generally and we're gonna talk specifically. So we'll, we're moving into the behavioral disorder section of this. And again, we're back at Hannes Finney's group, uh, Hannes Lowy's group, Finnish, Hannes Lowy's Finnish group. I'll get it out. Didn't realize I put three papers by him in here. Um, but he did this massive, he didn't actually do it. It's Mila Salonen's um, PhD thesis. Uh, it's done in his lab. But this is all Mila's work with the help of a lot of other people. Um, they did an online questionnaire that looked at 13,700 Finnish pet dogs and looked at anxiety in them. Okay, so here's what they found. And this is, when you see a percentage here, this is out of 13,700 13, dogs. So 30% of those dogs reacted to noise, um, slightly under 30% had fear, non-specific fear. And you're gonna see these blown up in a bit to show you what kind of noise, what kind of fear, what kind of reactions. Uh, some of them, about 25% react to surfaces or heights, a little over 20% uh, don't pay attention. Um, you see compulsive behavior in uh, slightly under 20%. That's interesting because I think that that report is high. I believe it is that high. I just am surprised that people are reporting it. Um, hyperactivity or, or impulsivity, and they, they define these very briefly for you. Um, again, at around 17% aggression, just a little less than that. And they came up with separation-related behavior at under 10%, which I find interesting. So this is 13,715 dogs and 264 breeds. And now they're going to blow these up. So here, these colors all represent the basic conditions. And then they're going to tell you what they do. So here are the dogs that react to fireworks, thunder, gunshots. Guns are not common in Finland except for hunting. Fear of dogs, fear of strangers, fear of novel situations, fear of surfaces and heights. There was no way to break that down. Inattention, hyper activity, impulsivity, they couldn't break those down. Um, 
Self-biting, licking surfaces, excess drinking, dogs who drink and drink and drink and are not thirsty, chasing their tail, pacing, uh, fly snapping, light chasing, staring, staring at things that aren't there generally, uh, aggression towards family members, aggression towards strangers, destroy and urinate when you're alone and vocalize and pant when you're alone. And they lumped those simply because their numbers were quite small. Okay, and then they did it, the standard heat map comorbidity. And this is the pairs comorbidity. So you see, in fact, that um, if you have noise sensitivity, you have a 35.7% chance of uh, having comorbid fear. And so you can look at all the other things that go with noise sensitivity. If the condition is noise sensitivity, here's the comorbid diagnosis for fear, aggression, fear of surfaces and heights, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you can read it both ways. And then if you look at the comorbidity risk ratio here, you see the, um, this is the odds ratio. So what are the chances? So if you have hyperactivity and impulsivity, um, the chance that you have separation related behavior is four times that of not having it. Okay, so if you have fear, the chance that you have separation related behavior is 2.8 times that. Okay, so this is important information, and it may be different in Finland. Uh, they may define some of the conditions or the way they evaluate them differently. These are all things that we have to consider, but it gives us this massive data set. And they also looked at age, so they realized that over time, noise, fear of thunder increased. Why? Because you're periodically exposed, and that's an ideal condition to increase the frequency. Um, aggression didn't, sorry, aggression and fear of strangers didn't really increase over time the same way. In fact, aggression starts out high. There's a little bit of a dip it, and then it goes up a bit and it levels out. Impulsivity starts high and it only drops later. Um, and fear of strangers, there's not that big a difference. So those are important patterns. They say nothing about the age of onset. And for those of you who want to wander through this paper on your own and look for your favorite breed, like Border Collie, Fear of Thunder, there you are. Border Collie, Tail Chasing. Border Collie, ooh, number one in Fly Snapping and Light Chasing. There you are. And this is actually a good reflection of what we see clinically in North America also. So those types of papers are becoming a little more common. They're difficult to do. Nick Dodman has a series of them. The group in Finland has a series of them. They are important because they give us the only prevalence data we have. The drawbacks to these papers is their questionnaires. Um, everything's in your definition, okay? You don't get to talk to these people. You don't get to evaluate the dog. Your definitions have to be so crisp that what one person says is what the other person says. And they assume that when you get to a sample size of 13,700 dogs, um, those are gonna wash out and they're probably right there. The problem comes when you don't have that sample size. Okay, I'm gonna say a few things about this 2018 and I did tell you there would be a couple of older papers. Coprophagia paper, and I'm only including this because I'm getting all these coprophagia questions lately. So this is uh, a little survey that looked at coprophagic behavior. These are the dogs, the breeds that they looked at and they were widespread and there are typos here. And I know I took them out of the final version and they were set incorrectly. Drives you nuts as an editor. But they had a wide range of breeds. And when they looked at this, um, these are the types of things that are available. This paper was done in Brazil, so these are products that are available in Brazil. And they looked at the score of effectiveness of what people thought was effective. Um, people felt that if they gave um, vitamins and minerals, it helped. Uh, it would be useful to know what the diets were to evaluate that. Preventing access to feces really was the helpful thing. What's important about this paper is this paper actually looked at enough dogs to tell you something about risk. And it found two things that matter. 
and they came down to summary in one finding. The co-inhabitant is coprophagic and the co-inhabitant isn't coprophagic. That's the thing that determines whether a puppy becomes coprophagic. And what they couldn't separate out was, did that co-inhabitant have to be related? And they have ones that they knew were not related, but they did not have enough dogs that they knew were related. They had enough to suggest that this could be exposure or it could be heritability or it could be both but it's the first time anybody's reported that. So how do you stop your dogs from being coprophagic? And people know that this runs in lines. Labrador breeders will tell you it runs in many Labrador lines. You don't expose them to these dogs, but what if it's genetic? Well, now we're back to why we talked about genetic tests in the beginning. Okay, I'm gonna talk briefly about our most recent paper, uh, which is our most recent data paper, which is about um, locomotion and problem solving in standardized cognitive tests and the role fear of noises plays. We ended up doing, a, and there will be a series of papers still to come out, I'm just slow, but uh, we, we looked at hundreds of dogs over a period of uh, five years. Um, in a, a set of 13 cognitive tests. And because these dogs were wearing um, what's basically an accelerometer around their neck, we were able to get movement in two directions and deviations from movement. So we knew that the most informative tests in terms of movement were these four tests, and I'm going to talk about the puzzle box test. So this is the puzzle box test. You bounce the ball, you roll it in the bottom. There are nine holes. We have these in a couple of sizes. The dog can use his feet. The dog can use his mouth. This is not a pet dog. It's a military dog. They can do whatever they want to get that ball out. They have to get the ball out within five minutes. If they get it out within five minutes, they get two more tries to get it out, and we collect the data. And they have a lot of fun. What we found was that dogs that were noise reactive using the same type of noise screen that they used in the big genetic studies. It's a version of the anxiety intensity rank scheme. So when we looked at the anxiety intensity rank or air score, dogs who are noise reactive were less likely to complete two out of three rounds of this test. And when we looked at the slower dogs, nine of the dogs who took 150 seconds or more were noise reactive. When we looked at the fastest of everybody's three trials, Five of the six dogs taking 150 seconds or more were noise reactive. Dogs who could learn to do so became faster with experience. And dogs who were not noise reactive were overrepresented in that group. In other words, and this is the key finding, success helped non-reactive dogs more than it helped noise reactive dogs. In other words, you're already impaired by noise, but now you can't learn from success. Well, why might that be? Because they don't move the same way. They don't even have the same learning opportunities. Here are the dogs that don't have noise reactivity. You see they're always moving. Doesn't matter whether it's done now or it's done a month and a half later, in this case, multiple months later. That's what they look like. These are the dogs with noise reactivity. They start, they stop, they move excessively, they don't move at all. And there's a way to measure this that's called fluidity. So here's the air score, how affected you are, and this is a mildly affected population. We had nine dogs that, and it's a small sample size, um, nine dogs that had a score of zero, 15 dogs that had, a, I'm sorry, um, yeah. 15 dogs that had a greater score, I'm sorry, this is not quite right, um, that had a score greater than zero and we wanted them to have a score of greater than um, 15 at one point. And we measured fluidity. Um, and fluidity, the way the people who make these tools call it, is not the way I thought of it. I thought of fluid movements as being these flexible, well-coordinated movements. No, fluidity in the literature that they're using means uh, starting and stopping in complexity of the three-dimensional movement. So we found that the dogs that had air scores that were high compared to zero started and stopped. They were higher in their fluidity index. 
And in fact, the dogs who solved the puzzle box in their first or best trial were more active than dogs who solved it slowly or not at all. So moving allowed you to learn about the box. And dogs who solved this test quickly did so by coordinating their movements with the ball. And dogs with zero error scores moved in this beautiful continuous way and they could learn from it and they got faster. And that was all missing for the noise reactive dogs. So this impaired performance in a problem solving task. It affected the way you moved and affected your ability to have access to and use information. And people have said we shouldn't treat mild noise reactive dogs for their fear. I'm sorry, veterinarians should be screening these dogs at every visit and they should treat them aggressively and early because really being afraid of noises turns off the problem solving part of your brain. So let's move on to treating behavior problems. And uh, this is a paper that was published recently out of the University of Pennsylvania. And uh, this is a crossover design. So some dogs got oral transmucosal dexmedetomidine. They got, the, they got Cilio, the, the product name, uh, first. And some of them got the placebo first. And they came in for a veterinary visit. And the question was, well, given that this is licensed to decrease fear of noise, will it decrease fear of veterinary visits? So what's interesting is that the owners scored uh, how easy this was to use. Everybody thought it was easy to use. And owners and veterinarians scored how tense the dog was. And there was no difference <laughs> between the dexmedetomidine and the placebo group. And you can just look, eyeball these numbers in whether or not the dog was upset during the exam. But when they looked at the videos, you got a decrease in whining, yelping, and grumbling and avoidance behaviors. And the dogs tried to jump off the table less frequently. So the question becomes, well, maybe the dose for noise is low for the type of fear and panic that dogs may have learned for veterinary practices. And perhaps a different dose will also allow the owner and the veterinarian in this blinded study to appreciate that there's a difference. So the scores didn't change, but actually many of the stress-related behaviors did improve, which is interesting because it means also that we don't look at the right behaviors. I wanna say a couple of things about giving pets drugs, and this paper has just come out. And this is a survey, again, that looked at which medications and supplements clients are willing to use and why. And I'm just going to tell you about the findings because they're important. This is 513 dog owners. It's not a small sample. Dog, there are four findings, and they're enumerated here. Dog owners were more comfortable with the use of fast-acting versus slow-acting medications. So oral transmucosal dexmedetomidine fast-acting medication, benzodiazepine, fast-acting medication, trazodone, relatively fast-acting medication. Um, the most concerning undesirable effects for owners were sedation, potential for addiction, which is what the benzos are about, and changing their dog's personality in a negative way. No one wants that. They want the dogs to be everything they can be. They want them to be happy and joyful. Most dog owners, and pay attention here because here's the meat, considered proven effectiveness to be an important consideration factor when considering psychoactive medication for their dogs, followed by ease of administration, veterinary recommendation. You don't rank up there with whether or not it works. They want to know if it works. They know you recommend things that aren't known to work. They're not thrilled with that. That's the hidden message here. And cost. And one of the things that concerns me is that so many of the supplements are more expensive than the medications we actually know will have an effect. And finally, um, people who took these medications themselves were very comfortable with their pets having them. There are lots of take home messages there. I'm gonna talk about a few more things before we wrap up. I wanna talk about this recent paper that looked at whether or not it really does help to train dogs with shock collars, okay? And this has been a big debate forever. 
And all the shock collar people will tell you that, oh, but they learn better, it's faster, it's more effective, it's more long lasting. So there were three groups and I wrote this out because it's not in a good form in the, the paper for me to abstract it for you. There was an e-collar group. These are manufacturer, manufacturers of the shock collars, nominated trainers who used e-stimuli as part of their training program. The first control group is the same humans. Those are the same trainers, but they're training the dog using techniques that they would use if they were not using shock. And then the second control group are independent professional trainers who focus primarily on positive reinforcement for training. They looked at the come and sit commands. They had a verbal, a hand signal, and a lead signal. They gave descriptions so that everybody was on the same page. So, you know, you ask the dog to put its rear on the ground for sitting. You give a hand signal and you either give the hand signal, you know, for sit, or some people went down, that's fine. And then you pulled the leash either up or down, depending on how you do this. When you look at the distribution of these, and I'll just rattle through the graphs and let them speak for themselves. Um, they did this every other day. Training should be done every other day because you consolidate the memories when you sleep and you do better with a day off. So that's what the color bars are. And this is the mean number of verbal commands. This is the using shock, the shock trainers using other commands, and the positive trainers. Positive trainers on every day, except for this second day, use requests less frequently and the first day. here. If you look at hand commands, the positive trainers did better. And it doesn't matter how I format these, I can't get the the zoom photo out of it. Um, and if you look at the number of lead commands and how many times you had to do it, the positive trainers barely used the lead at all and got the dog to comply. Okay. If you now look at the mean latency to respond, dogs who are trained with positive methods respond more quickly. And if you look at the mean latency to respond for sit, this is come, which is hard it's even more exposed for sit. So they learn to do this faster if there are only positive methods used. Sorry, I have dogs playing at my feet and they're playing roughly. Okay, so this is a direct quote from the paper. Control group two, the positive reward people, achieved better responses to both sit and come commands after a single instruction in the allocated time. They had shorter latencies than the e-collar group. There was no significant difference in the proportion of commands disobeyed between the three groups, although significantly fewer commands were given to the control two group, which is the positive group. There was no difference in the number of verbal cues used in each group, but control two, the positive reinforcement group, had fewer hand and lead signals, and control one made more use of those signals than did the e-collar group. The e-collar group doesn't give signals. They give shocks. Same people, two different strategies. And that's a hidden finding here. These findings refute the suggestion that training with an e-collar is either more efficient or results in less disobedience, even in the hands of experienced trainers. In many ways, training with positive reinforcement was found to be more effective at addressing target behaviors as well as general obedience training. This method of training poses fewer risks to dog's welfare and the quality of the human-dog relationship. Given these results, we suggest that there is no evidence to indicate that e-collar training is necessary. I concur with that. Every study has shown this. It's time for these to be illegal worldwide. It is time for invisible fences to go away because that's an unpredictable shock from the dog's standpoint. It's past time for us to move on. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you about the fun, we're gonna wrap up with the fun facts to know and tell and the local significance. Remember I said by the time I'm done, none of you will believe in domestication? won't be quite true. Uh, this is a very cool paper out of Eleanor Carlson's group. 
Eleanor Carlson is a, a molecular geneticist, molecular geneticist, who doesn't really know that much about dogs. She's actually a cat person. And lovely lady, uh, works with the Broad MIT project on the faculty at uh, University of Massachusetts. And she was talking to people about the farmed foxes in Russia and began to think about what do we really know? And that this says the history of farm foxes undermines animal domestication syndrome. Okay, so what is animal domestication syndrome? Okay. Domestication syndrome is defined as a suite of traits that rises in frequency as a direct consequence of selection on tameness due to linkage or pleiotropy, things that go together. For a characteristic to be included in domestication syndrome, it should fulfill three essential, not optional, essential criteria. Onset, a trait must appear or at a minimum rise rapidly in prevalence in conjunction with the onset of tameness. Frequency, trait must be significantly more common in the selected population. Association, a trait must be associated with tameness in individuals not just the population level where you look at an average. The tamer the animal, the more likely it is to exhibit the characteristics of domestication syndrome, and you need to know about the individuals. Okay, so they looked across all of our domesticated species, and this is why there are so many people's names on the paper, because this was a heck of a lot of work, and one of her postdocs actually wrote it. Dogs, cats, goats, pigs, rabbits, rats, mice, the foxes and the Russian farmed foxes. So these are the ones that all the genetic and the tameness information about changes in hormones and behavior come from. And lo and behold, they found something distressing. Nobody actually has all these data. So all these breeds that we say are domesticated, there are no published data for rats, mice, rabbits, very few published data for pigs, very few published data for goats. The breed that the species that has the most data are dogs. The Russian fox farm data aren't any better than the fox data in general, really, with one difference. There's a, they've reported tail carriage, and it's the only place that that has been found. And then they looked at all of the things that the has been claimed from the Russian population the craniofacial morphology changes, the curled tail, the depigmentation that make these foxes look like border collies, the brown modeling, the delayed ear raising, the change in seasonality and the early sexual maturation. And what they found is most of these traits were found in the PEI farmed fox populations that were developed in the late 1800s. And where do you think the Russians got their foxes? They bought them from PEI. So whether or not there was an intention for these Prince Edward Island bred foxes, and you can still see some of the old fox farms with some of the horrible old touches, um, but whether or not they intended to shift them in that direction or it happened, to claim that their handling did it is a mistake because most of these things were already either there and you knew the percentages. And then the rest of it, there are actually no data and there are no data from the Russian population. So there we go. So we've always thought about the tamed Russian foxes and what that meant for hormone cycles. They season twice a year, they're out of season. Uh, they look like border collies, they're very friendly and lo and behold, that may have been long-standing. And the question is, did something happen here or were the foxes that were here like that to begin with? And if the foxes that were here were like that to begin with, and people will tell you they're still extraordinarily curious and friendly. Ours comes to the door whenever she has a problem. When she had a, a, an injured leg this winter in the snow, she actually came and knocked on the front door. Interesting behavior. Okay, now the fun facts to know and tell. This is a very cool paper because it's a citizen science paper. Directional preferences of dogs changes in the presence of a bar magnet. 
this guy got high school students to do this. I love this paper and I want more people to do citizen science. They looked at the way dogs squatted to eliminate. And the kids went out and they found out from videos and online stuff, you know, people, they, they got online groups and people told them, yeah, my dogs face north south when they go to the bathroom. Okay, so that's what they normally do. So here's a subset of dogs and you can see the south facing prevalence and they're a little southwest. And what did they do? They stuck a bar magnet. They got a bunch of bar magnets and they stuck them. They had people stick them next to their dogs. And lo and behold, the dog shifted its body posture in the direction of following the magnet because now they don't know where true north is in the way that was predicted. And what this paper tells you is that dogs are sensitive to polarity. They know where the North Pole is. Think about that. Very cool citizen science paper. I love it. And then comes this one about magnetic alignment enhances homing efficiency in hunting dogs. And these dogs were fit with an apparatus that's fairly complex. I don't know how none of these dogs strangled themselves. Um, these are two small dogs, uh, uh, a terrier and a dachshund. This is the camera, okay? And this is what they see through the camera. And this is their tracking system. So you get to see what they see and you also get to track them. And what they found was that dogs do two different types of runs. They do a tracking run where they go back and forth. And this is the distribution of the tracking runs. They do a scouting run where north-south matters. Remember, north-south, the way you eliminate matter. And in fact, if you go out and you do a big loop, before they do the loop to find out what's there, they do a 20 meter out run in a north-south direction. And here are the data. This is how often it happens in scouting. This is how often it happens in tracking. And this is the difference between tracking and scouting. So here's tracking, you go, you come back in the same way. Here's your 20 meter north-south outrun. You go in a loop, you come back. Here's a combination. And in fact, when they did straight tracks, this is tracking, you go back and forth, and this is scouting. And you start here, there's your outrun north-south direction, you come back, you take in all the scents, and you come back on the straight and narrow. Compass directions matter. Dogs aren't randomly wandering off. They are aligning themselves because when they go to look for a human or a bomb or a landmine or a drug in a place that they don't know, they don't have landmarks they recognize. And you'd best train them in places they don't know because otherwise they rely on the landmarks. And in this case, what they do is they line themselves up so they know where they are and then they can measure everything from there. Two very cool papers, um, one high tech, one citizen science, very cool. And our last paper is, is something, given the citizen science one I just discussed on the magnets, I'm really hoping somebody turns this into a citizen science project, and maybe it'll be one of you. Laterality is a tool for assessing breed differences in emotional reactivity in domestic cats. Well, they didn't actually do that, but they did do breed differences, and they did look at laterality, and this is the first step. And why are they talking about emotional reactivity? Because we know that dogs that are left pawed are overrepresented in dogs that react to noises and other things that are scary. Okay, so this is a commercially available pet food toy for feeding cats called the cat. -it. Okay, and they have to reach in and get the food. And you see this cat doing it with his right paw. So when they looked at rag dolls, Maine Coons, it's not the way I would have spelled that, Bengals and Persians, they find that rag dolls use their right paw most often, Maine Coons are evenly split between left and right. Bengals are left pawed and Bengals are more closely ancestral to wild cats. And some of them can have problems. And Persians are ambidextrous. And the one that jumps out at me is if Persians are ambidextrous, their brains are structured differently. They don't have hemispheric preference. So I would love to know if that's true. But 
Think of what you could do with a short questionnaire about behaviors and getting people to get a cat at toy, making the video or just counting for you. All you need are a hundred paws, you know, and what you do is number of left, number of right, over the com right minus left over the combined left and right, multiply it by a hundred. You have your left bias. If it's a negative number, it's a right bias. It's very simple. And for those of you who are elsewhere besides Prince Edward Island, this was taken the other day. Um, this is functionally my backyard, and this is autumn on Prince Edward Island, where those foxes that ended up in Russia all started out. You have my information, my email address, Twitter, website, the journal. I hope you're as passionate about the literature as I am, and I just really enjoyed this. And I don't know if there are questions in there, no open questions, so everybody's falling asleep. But I hope I've empowered you to go search out the literature and find some really cool things because this is a subsample of what I could have told you. Great, thank you, Karen. That was really interesting. I do have a quick question. I think this idea of citizen science is really, uh, is really neat. Do you have other ideas? It seems like you might have some of how we could utilize, first of all, maybe give just a short introduction to what citizen science is and then how we might sure. I think we can use it a lot. Um, and I'm, I'm sorry, I really should have drawn all the lines and I didn't. And uh, that was foolish. But so I really feel like I'm, I'm sitting in a sunset because I'm sitting in a sunset. Okay, I'm moving so I can do this. Um, citizen science. Yes, yeah, citizen science is where you reach out on social media and people either uh, complete questionnaires or they do something for you. Uh, you give them a set of instructions, like I want to know whether your cat is left or right pod. I need for you to get uh, a cat toy like the cat it, or I need to know if your dog is left or right pod. Um, this will only work for dogs who really like to manipulate Kongs, but I'd like you to stuff a Kong. I want you to give the dog the con. I want you to count in five minutes the number of times the dog touches it with its left pod, manipulates it versus its right paw. Um, I want you to tell me what happens when you leave the house. I would like for you to tell the dog to sit five feet away from the door. I would like you to say the following words, and that's going to be, you know, whatever the dog's name is. Be a good girl. I will be back in five minutes. Close the door. Stand 20 feet away. Tell me what you hear and you give the people a set of choices and they can record their choices online. And this can be pretty simple where somebody else tabulates it. Some of these very sophisticated online ones tabulate it for you. You can get people to send you videos. You could get information. You could get thousands of 15 second videos, which is gonna take somebody hours and hours to analyze. But if it's specific enough and it's important, you can do this. Why does laterality matter? Laterality matters because it tells you which side of your brain is dominant. If you lack lateralization, like those Persians, you may have a brain that integrates information in a very different way. And you can talk about your analytical brain and your emotional brain, and people tend to think of the left-sided brain as more emotional and the right-sided as more analytical. Um, some people think of it in the reverse way, but um, we should know these things. And until you know how much variation there is out there, you can't say anything. We don't know how many dogs bark when their humans leave. You could find that out by having people stand there with, uh, with their, their iPhone and logging it into a little data sheet. You know, am I 20 feet away from the door? Yes. Can I, can I go where they can't see me? Yes. Can I come back in 20 minutes and find out if they're still barking? Yes. You could have prevalence data for dogs who bark um, when left that nobody has. If you wanted to know whether those dogs were distressed, you could add to that a recording. And there are some types that are alert barks and some types that are distressed barks. We are under exploiting this and it has a hidden advantage of empowering kids in school, 
which is what that Israeli citizen science project did. And he has a plea at the end of that paper for more citizen science papers and for using high school kids who are just discovering science to collect real data. And this is how you get people interested in science. So I just think that, I mean, I could, I could list a, a large number of things that I think uh, could be done in citizen science, uh, Katie. Do you have literature you'd recommend to subscribing to online and in print? Oh, what a good question. Um, okay, let me tell you what's involved in subscribing. Um, a journal of Veterinary Behavior, which is the journal I'm most familiar with because I edit it, has six or eight groups of people that, um, like the Pet Professional Guild, um, the American Veterinary Society of Animal Behaviorists, um, the college, the specialty colleges all over the world. Um, and they, if you're a member of one of those groups uh, or you decide to join one of those groups, maybe you like working dogs and you want to go to working dog meetings or talk about them online. The International Working Dog Breeding Association is a member group. So you join and instead of paying $200 a year for the journal, you pay 40 and you get the journal. Okay, so that's one way to do it. Pick your fields. The other way to do it is to start paying attention to open access journals. Till you know what you really want to do, I would try not to pay for this. And what you can do is you can go to something like Science Direct. Just type in Science Direct, it will come right up. And you can have it or Google Scholar tell you when papers in your field of interest and they will give you keywords you can choose are being published and you can ask them to tell you when it's in an open access journal. And that way, you can decide what you want to do. Clearly, the journals in this field that matter are Applied Animal Behavior Science, which is not an open access journal, Journal of Veterinary Behavior, not an open access journal, Animal Behavior, not an open access journal, Behavior, not an open access journal. The veterinary journals that include survey things like uh, Canadian Veterinary Journal, JAVMA, uh, the Veterinary Journal, Journal of Small Animal Practice will all have behavior papers in them. Journal of Feline Medicine and Surgery, they have an open version, but most often it's not, it's not uh, open access. Katie, do you have anything to add? Nope, I think that sounded good. There is one more question from the chat. If you want to go there, um, I can sure. read it. In behavioral medicine and in veterinary medicine in general, evidence from the research is often lacking. What are some urgent issues that you think need to be investigating? Boy, that's a really, really good question. And I'll tell you the things that I think, uh, there are two things. One is data-based and one is biological-based. I think Nick Dodman and uh, Hannes Lowy's lab aren't exactly the right track. Um, I think that we need massive surveys. I have tried to get the American Kennel Club interested in this multiple times. I have tried, uh, the Norwegian Kennel Club does a great job, works with their geneticists. I've contributed to some of their behavior surveys. I haven't tried the Canadian Kennel Club. We need good surveys using validated questionnaires and well-defined behaviors where we make sure everybody's talking about the same thing. My biggest complaint about these questionnaires has to do with aggression because in virtually none of them is aggression sufficiently well-defined to eliminate reactive barking. And barking is something that's difficult to figure out. So, you know, most of us get biting. Some of us get growling. And people make mistakes with growling. If you look at clinical questionnaires, you can look at the mistakes people make because you've got the dog in front of you. And they make a lot of mistakes in interpretation. So I think we need to improve that, but I think we need to do more of it. The second thing that I think is the burning issue is um, there is no excuse no excuse at all, except people haven't been willing to fund it. 
that the most recent and only data on neurodevelopment in dogs and how dogs and cats of different breeds develop and learn about their world and effects of maternal nutrition and maternal exposure and what mom went through uh, were investigated in the 1950s. In other words, Scott and Fuller's book is the only book that covers some of that stuff. And that book is based on research papers that were published over 20 years. It's inexcusable that we know so little about neurobehavioral development. It's inexcusable that we know so little about environmental effects. It's inexcusable that we know so little about epigenetic effects on the species that we're interested in. Um, and for dogs and cats, it matters. And it's past time to address it. Excellent. Thanks everyone. It doesn't look like there's any more questions. There was a, a addition to the chat box from Carolyn about uh, academia.edu that you can subscribe to. Uh, so Absolutely. Great idea. And I was sitting here thinking, what other journals can I tell you about? Animals. Uh, Animal, yeah, is uh, an open access journal. And it does a lot of behavioral stuff. And you can look at the Frontier series because Frontiers will be in neuro. I think they've got a neuropsychology one. They've got psychology. They've got veterinary medicine. And, but they do special issues. So there will be like a working dog behavior issue or a working dog issue that also has a lot of physiology. Um, I'm overseeing a special issue on neurobehavioral genetics for animals, so that'll be out sometime. We're just getting started, so figure 18 months. Um, and, uh, you know, those are the types of things that you can do with some of these, but that's a great suggestion. There are lots of opportunities. You just have to find them. <laughs> and I'm here to help if people have questions. Yeah, and it does seem like journals are more and more moving to open access, so hopefully that'll be the norm in the future. Yeah, and, and the nice thing is that um, there, has been, there has been such pressure put on by the Europeans for legacy journals that they, the legacy publishers, they now all have open access options, and you can put preprints of your papers online, and I don't think many people realize that. So you can often get preprints. They won't look like what I just showed you, but they will have the information. 